everybody. Thank you for your kind hospitality to our family. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to you tonight. If you love your pastor, would you get loud and scream and clap and yell? That's what I'm talking about. That's, that's a good church right there. Had some places where they booed. Had to change my whole message. But you're very blessed to have Pastor and Sister Jones. We love them very much. They spoke on a panel at our church Friday night and did incredible, and we were all in awe of the things they said, and it was an awesome opportunity for our church to hear them, and it's an honor to be with you tonight. Aren't you thankful for such an incredible atmosphere, incredible church that you have? You're so blessed. Amen. But Lavelle, love you very much. Remember when I preached to Brother Gurley's all the time, and Brother Lavelle was down there, and, and uh, he was leading all that stuff and directing all the, the, the amazing chaos that was so organized and beautiful, and that's why they are where they are, just incredible leader, and give him honor tonight also. Glad he's here. And way in the back, the prettiest girl in the room, and my beautiful wife, Janae, and then my four babies are here with us, and we love you. We're we're glad they're here tonight also. Amen. Uh, Pastor has asked me to talk to you about uh, fasting. Don't leave yet. That was a resounding, uh, I'm not sure we should continue tonight, uh, sigh that just took place. But uh, it is something that the Lord has given me passion about over the years and wrote a book on it. and. Uh, but I want to just kind of give you some stuff tonight. I just taught our church a series on it. I'm going to try to condense it here for you to give you some ideas of what God can do through the fasting life. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. I won't uh, read a long text, just a couple of verses, three verses. Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. I want to talk to you about focus on fasting. Focus on fasting. I hope something happens tonight. Truly, I hope that there's an impartation that gets loose in the room, that changes you, changes your family, and gets you some answered prayers this year in Jesus' name. If you want some answered prayers, would you worship the Lord one more time? Lord Jesus, release revelation right now in this house, front to back. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Take over every spirit that would come against it in Jesus' name. And somebody said amen. And you may be seated. If I say things you don't like, and go to pastor, and if he says I'm wrong, he's right, and I'm wrong. But here we go. The word fasting means to abstain from food for a period of time. Quite simply, if you are eating, you are not fasting. And if you are fasting, you are not eating. I'm going to make some enemies on the first statement here. The Daniel's fast is not fasting. Yeah, not even an amen, like a, a nervous burp. Most people that do the Daniels fast, the real reason is they're trying to lose weight. But it is good, it is consecrated, but fasting in the truest sense of the word, the truest definition of the word, is to abstain from food. I believe the word fasting should be called slowing because if you ever want the clock to stop in your life, go on a fast. If you ever think that the time is flying by with the kids and they're growing up so fast, go on a fast. You will beg the clock to move. It is just that powerful. When you go on a fast, time stands still. There's all kinds of fasts in the Bible. There was the absolute fast, which is no food, no liquid, not even water. Uh, Moses did that. Esther did that. Paul did that. Nineveh. The city did that. There's the partial fast, which is water. 
and other liquids at times. We don't know the people that, what they drank, but they, we know that they ate and then, or they did not eat, and then they, they drank something. Jesus fasted food. He, he drank something. Elijah drank something. David drank something. Daniel, Paul, etc. There are 59 total fast in your Bible. 31 were individuals fasting on their own, and 28 were proclaimed corporate fast where a leader would say we're all going to go on a fast. There are people who fasted multiple times, like Paul and Moses and Anna, the great prophetess in the New Testament. The Bible said about Paul that he was in fastings often. He was constantly killing his flesh for what God was going to do through him. The length of fast in your Bible range from one day up to 40 days, although Moses did 40 days back to back, and some people say they're not sure if he ate when he came off the mountain because the next day he went back up the mountain and did 40 more days. The most he could have probably had was one or two meals in 80 days of time. That is absolutely astounding. Uh, Fasting, I had one young man the other day tell me in our church, I hope this is not being recorded. Well, they're not. They're not watching, so... Um, he needed an answer to prayer, and I said, uh, "What's the last? When's the last time you fasted?" And he said, uh, "A couple weeks ago, Pastor. I went on a good one." I said, "Good, good. How long did you go?" He said, "I went a good five or six hours." I said, "I'm sorry, my phone messed up. I thought you said five or six hours." He said, "Yes, sir. I did five or six hours." I said, "You didn't fast. You were just in between meals. You didn't have a chance to eat before dinner. It's like twelve to six or twelve to five. You're a hero. And so we begin to tell what, what fasting is. Now, this is going to be something you may, may not see, but biblical fasting, obviously, we've, dis- we've discovered it's not eating. So a lot of times, people will call certain things fast, but they're not really fasting. We call it a media fast, a sports fast, a coffee fast. The truth is these are vows, that you make to God, I'm not gonna do this for a period of time, but really, it's not fasting. I know it's just, it's just language, it's just a word, but we call it a fast because it is a time of consecration, but we're still eating. The rich young ruler was told to get rid of all his stuff, but he didn't call that a fast. It was just something he was supposed to do that he probably did not end up doing. Why do I need to fast? First of all, the greatest craving of every human being in this room is food. Just nudge your neighbor and say, I know you like to eat. You can say you're the vegan and all that weird stuff, but I promise you, you like to eat. The first sin in the world involved food. Jesus was tempted with food. Fasting food drains the flesh and connects you to the spirit. Fasting food intensifies your relationship with God if it's done properly. It is absolutely imperative that you know Jesus said, when ye fast. He expected his people to fast. Now, some, let me just be very clear. Some people cannot fast because of health reasons. And if you have any health issues, you need to go to pastor before you endeavor on your 4,000-day journey that God's calling you to. And, and if you've got all kind of blood sugar issues and that, then you need to talk to pastor. But if your issues are headaches, that's called detoxing. I'd fast, but my head hurts. That's because you drank four gallons of coffee yesterday. It has nothing to do with the devil fighting you. And then you use this term, the Lord release me from the fast four hours in. The attack was so strong, the demons of hell were attacking my mind. No, you drank too much Coke and ate too much chocolate during the holidays, and your head is hurting. Sorry for being real. I, you, know, you don't have to ever have me back. I love you, but it's just the truth. <laughs> when do I need to go on a fast? When you are needing direction. When you are facing a decision, Ezra and Esther, we'll talk about them later. When you are feeling carnal or disconnected, you need to go on a fast. When your flesh is leading your decisions, when you're not sinning outwardly but your mind is, it's quiet but it's right, you need to go on 
a fast, when there are needs not being met in your life by simply having a prayer life, you need to go on a fast. Fasting is the ultimate weapon in the spirit world because it kills all flesh and connects you to the spirit and stuff starts happening like you've never seen. Lee Stone King told me years ago, fasting weakens the devil. If you have a devil attacking your home, go on a fast. Tertullian, the philosopher, said fasting makes man a friend of God, and the demons are aware of this. Benjamin Franklin said the best of all medicines is resting and fasting. And let me just get real. Nothing activates the spirit world like fasting and prayer. Nothing. Nothing. Wait on God all you want to. If you want something to stir up, you have to fast for it. When Daniel was fasting 21 days, on the 21st day, the angel of the Lord came down and said, we heard you on day one. But the head demon of this area, the prince of Persia, blocked us and resisted us. He said, when God had to send us back up angels to help us, and we got through, and I am come for your words, your words that you were praying, your, your prayer request that you were fasting about, the enemy was trying to block it. And so I, we finally broke through, and I've got your words. Now, when I go back up to heaven with your words, which, by the way, that's what angels do, Revelation 5 and Revelation 8. Angels dump out your prayers before the Lord. So he's got Daniel's prayer. I'm going to take your prayer up to heaven, and when I go back up to heaven, not only is that demon, the prince of Persia, going to fight me, he's recruited his friend, the prince of Grisha. The head demon in a different nation is going to come help him fight me. Why? Because hell would rather leave their post in in an entire nation of nobody doing anything and fight one child of God who's fasting for an answer than anybody else sitting there waiting on God. When you, when you start to pray and fast, you start fights in the spirit world. You want angels to move, go on a fast. You want demons to flee, go on a fast. Nothing says I am serious more to God than somebody fasting about something in their life. It's like fuel to prayer. It's like, it's like prayer that never dies, never leaves the throne room. It's like if, if my wife sprays perfume on and walks into a room and then walks out of the room and then I walk into that room, I I can smell that she's been in the room. That's what fasting does. When you pray something, you may pray it one time and maybe nothing happens. But when you fast about it, it's like an incense that goes up before God. And it's like you're still praying. You said the prayer one time, but 24 hours later, it's like you're before God saying, please answer it. Please answer it. Please come through. Please make a way. Please save my baby. Please intervene. How bad do you want your prayers answered? Stop letting yourself off the hook. Well, I prayed five minutes. When was the last time you fasted five days? And said, I'm not, Shotaya, I am not leaving here until something breaks. I've got to have a miracle in my house. My baby's got to come back to God. I need this job. I need direction. Prove that you want it. Anybody can wait on God. Anybody can be disconnected, but when you want it, you've got to go after it. Now, is this mine? I didn't want to drink if it was mine. <laughs> it wasn't mine. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let me, before I get to the rewards of fasting, let me give you seven essentials for extended fast and seven suggestions for extended fasting. And yes, I have fasted 40 days. I'm not saying that to brag, but I'm just telling you this stuff works. All right, seven essentials for going on an extended fast. What's an extended fast? Something longer than a day. You should be doing one day every week to two weeks, hopefully, to keep yourself, keep your flesh in check. If your flesh is raging, well, that's just who we are. We're all angry in my family. You don't fast. Well, I do. My dad and my grandpa, they all struggle with perversion. It's just our struggle. No, you need to fast and break that thing. 
break that thing till it's not your kid's struggle. All right, number one, if you're going to go on extended fast, consecrate in advance. Willpower only lasts so long. I have learned this, that on long fast, I go longer when I pray more before I fast. You don't just get up and say, I'm going to go on a 40-day fast tomorrow, and you haven't been praying for the last 40 days. The demons will eat your lunch. You'll tap out by day two or three, I promise you. But if you want to go longer on a fast, get yourself connected in prayer day after day after day. Show God that you're serious about where you're headed. Number two, consecrate while you are fasting. Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 3. I'm not sure if we gave him that or not. Isaiah chapter 58 and verse 3. I'll read it. It says, I'm not sure if I gave that verse or not, but I think I did. It says, wherefore have we fasted, say, thee, say they, and thou seest not. They're complaining to God. We went on a fast and nothing happened. We have afflicted our soul, and you take no knowledge. Behold, the Lord said, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. You undo everything you're doing because you're fasting but still carnal. You're finding pleasure. So because you can't eat, you do other things that feed your flesh. Ooh. So you're really not pursuing me. You're trying to make yourself comfortable while you're pursuing me. I learned a while back, God told me, stop trying to survive your consecration time with me. Stop trying to survive your, your moments where you die on the altar. Stop letting your flesh live through it. Paul did not say, I almost die daily. He said, I die daily. I don't get up until I'm dead. I don't get up done from the prayer room until my flesh is on the altar. You know, we call morning devotions like, such a cute little statement. I'm just doing my morning devotion. The word devoted in Hebrew means to slaughter, to extinguish, or to exterminate. And the Bible said in Leviticus, everything devoted belonged to God because it was dead. In other words, if you're really doing a morning devotion, you're not leaving until flesh is dead. If you're leaving with flesh active, don't call it a devotion. If you're really going to be devoted, stay in the prayer room until you leave a different person than the person you were when you started the that's awful hard, preacher. Okay, keep waiting on your answer. Number three, when you're fasting, focus on God. I tell people this as a suggestion, but it is, it is wise that if you're going on an extended fast to shut down the other voices. Moses, I'm going to give you an example. Moses fasted 40 days. He had Joshua on the mountain halfway up. He had 70 elders at the base of the mountain. He comes down from hearing from God, has the Ten Commandments. Everybody's naked, worshiping a golden calf. Moses snaps. As Brother Gurley said Sunday, only person in the Bible to break all Ten Commandments at the same time. Just boom. Broke them all, went crazy. And he said, I, and then he, he realizes he's messed up, so he said, God, show me your glory. And the Lord said, come back tomorrow, meet me at the top of the mountain. And then he said, let no flesh come with you. Let nobody come. Don't even let an animal graze on the mountain. You came up last time disconnected by all the sounds of the people. I've learned if I really need to hear from God, shut down the other voices. That might be sports to me. It might be social media to you. It might be something different. It might be uh, text threads. I don't know. But sometimes if you really want to hear from God, you've got to be focused when you approach him, it is disrespectful to approach God distracted and not really desire what he's trying to say. In other words, I just want him to tell me what I want to hear, that, that you're going to go to him distracted. But when you really are focused on God, you don't care what he talks about, when he talks, where he talks, about what situation he brings up. I just know I want his attention. And when you get like that, your focus. Number five, stay spiritually busy during your fast. Stay busy. Keep yourself going. Stay, listen to preaching. Don't skip church when you're fasting. Sorry. I would go. 
I would go to church, Pastor, but I'm on day two. You understand. What you're not telling me is, I am going to Target still today. Still going to Home Goods. Oops, sorry, ladies. Hopefully, not any dudes. I'm still going to Hobby Lobby, but I'm not, I can't go to church. Stay busy spiritually. Stay, listen to preaching. Read the Bible. Have, have positive conversations. Do things that keep you connected to your mission. When you're fa- Moses fasted 80 days, and he didn't just get the Ten Commandments. He wrote the entire plan of the tabernacle in 80 days. He also saw God's past, God's back parts, which in Hebrew is his past, which, by the way, Moses is the one who wrote the book of Genesis. If you're wondering where Moses saw creation and where you, how you can read about it, it was on a fast when God showed Moses his back parts or his past. Moses was fasting, my goodness, and God showed him a movie of what happened on day one and day two and day three and day four and day five and some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, but it really will happen. If you want to have visions and dreams and answers and see things, you've got to start fasting for it. can't go to new levels of spiritual authority with the same amount of flesh you've always had and let live. Number six, prepare yourself for temptation. When Matthew 4 talks about Jesus being led in the wilderness, it does not say he was led in the wilderness to fast. It said he was led to be tempted of the devil. So he fasted. He knew the devil was out there. It's almost like Jesus went looking for him. He was led to be tempted. He knew Satan's going to come to me. So he, how did he prepare himself? He just fasted until the devil showed up. Bad day to mess with Jesus. Number seven, come out glowing. Come out of your fast different. Get everything you can out of the fast you go on. Expect stuff to happen and come out like Moses did the second time and his face was so bright, he shined with the glory of God. You want to come out and people say, that person's different. She prays different. There's something different about his anointing. He's preaching different. She, I feel something when she sings. What, what's going on? There's the glow of the consecration. Those are seven Essentials. Let me give you seven suggestions, then we'll get into some rewards. Number one, I always do this when I go on a long fast. Make a list worth fasting about. Okay? Not, not something you can fix on your own. Make a, a prayer list with, with situations so big that you could never fix them on your own and pray that list every day. Pray that list every day. Have a reason why you're fasting. I've seen thousands of people go on long fasts because of this stuff. And I, the, the only few that I've seen be discouraged, they all have one thing in common. They did not have something they were fasting for. You need to have something you're fasting for and you believe is going to happen. It is pointless to fast without faith. If you think that I'm just killing my flesh, you're, you know what's going to happen? Well, I would fast, but I get angry. Fasting brings the anger out to the surface. Fasting brings the lust to the surface. Fasting brings the depression to the surface. It's stuff that's dwelling in you that's trying to get out of you. And so you keep fasting, but you need to believe that that stuff's going to leave me. I will not be angry when I come out of this. I will not have this addiction. I'm breaking this in Jesus' name. I'm going to be different when I'm All right, number two, read Bible verses and quotes about fasting every day. Isaiah 58 is the fasting chapter. Read that. Read Matthew 17. Read read Matthew 6. There's stories throughout the 59 different stories about fasting. You can find something to read all day long, but read stuff about fasting. One of the greatest quotes I ever got was Jim Blackshear told me. He said, you can eat the rest of your life. That kept me on my 40. He said, you can eat the rest of your life. So when I was tempted on day six or day 13 or day whatever, it was like, I can eat this later. I'm good. But this is a window that's open to me that I've got to walk through. I've got to get this answer. Avoid mealtime failures, number three, with, and replace them with reading, praying, listening to preaching, phone calls, go on walks, do light exercise, but do something in the mealtime to replace the meal. So if you're sitting there watching the family eat, 
I mean, you can do that. I, mean, I had to do that a few times. It's, it's miserable. I don't suggest, like, walking around and looking in the pantry the whole time. Like, wow, look at all the chocolate. No, that, I, find something that you can get away from the food with when everybody's eating. This is a big one, number four, stay accountable. I'm going to get on some stuff here in a little bit, and I'm just going to say this. Uh, uh, in our text, we talk about how Jesus talked to people about not letting everybody know when you're fasting, okay? Now, I want to be very clear about something. The hypocrites, he said, they want everybody to know that they're fasting. They, that they appear all, to all men that they're fasting. So in other words, the hypocrites don't care who you are. When they meet you, they want you to know, guess what, I'm fasting. That's a hypocrite. But it doesn't mean you don't tell anybody that you're fasting. Because if that's the case, how come we know about these fasts? I'll wait on you. We know about Jesus' own fast. When no one was around him because he told somebody. We know about Elijah's fast that nobody was around him because he told somebody. Your pastor needs to know when you're fasting. Well, it's quiet in there. Well, I'm, oh, I better stay. I better stay in my lane on that one. But the old evangelist in me would park. Your pastor needs to know. He is your covering. No matter how spiritual you think you are, you need a covering when it comes to stepping into the spirit world. You need the pastor praying for you. If you're on five days, I'm not saying you fast one day, I get it. But if you're on an extended fast, tell your pastor. This is probably not going to go over very well. You ought to tell your spouse, too. You want to see a real marriage fight break out. Don't tell your wife you're fasting today. Then when she makes plans for lunch, let her know you're not eating. And the war will begin. <laughs> I had one guy say, hey, Brother Herring, can you come to the church and pray for me? This was a few years ago. He said, I'm, I'm hurting and I'm on a fast and I'm, I'm really hurting bad. I, I, need a, I, need a, I need an answer from God. I said, okay. So I drove down there. He said, I said, what day are you on? He said, I'm on day six. I said, you're hurting bad. He said, yeah. I said, he, he had done several 40-day fasts. And I said, you're hurting on day six? He said, yeah. And he started shaking. And I said, have you drank any water? He said, no, sir. Have you haven't drank water for six days? He said, no, sir. I said, next question, does your wife know this? No, sir. I said, dude, you better go home and eat now. He's like, what? I said, you're going to die. That is not the will of God for you to actually die while you're fasting. I said, and if you don't die, she's going to kill you. If you don't tell her, you haven't sipped water for six days. Be accountable. Number five, hydrate or dihydrate. As the old Starbucks guy used to tell us every morning in Florida, we'd go up to the Starbucks and he'd say, hydrate or dihydrate. And that was his way. You need to drink a lot of water. First four days of a fast. You normally don't tap into ketosis until day four of a fast. Most human beings because of all the sugar and all the caffeine and stuff in the body. So I would just simply say that if you want to feel better, hydrate as much as you can the first four days, especially. Number, number six, let go of your stopwatch. Give God time to answer the prayers. Don't say, well, I fasted three days and nothing happened 30 days after, so that was a waste of time. You are not, the, you, you are not in control of the clock of when God answers the prayer. Just believe that the fast has been accomplished and something's going to happen, whether it's in 30 days or 30 weeks or 30 years. When I finished the 40-day fast, I was on day 37, 38, and a, an older pastor's wife said, you're going to see the rewards of this fast start manifesting one year from now. And that discouraged me because I was, I mean, that's 37 days of no food is pretty hard to do. And I'm sitting there going, I'd rather have some rewards now. And she said, no, and I, almost for a year I fought discouragement, I fought depression, and one year later, the things I was fasting for started opening up. And in, 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 Latin, in, and in a matter of about 10 years after that, we saw over 15,000 people in America receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. We saw the dead raised. We saw miracles beyond miracles beyond miracles. Fasting broke it open. We would go to... 
first church in Houston, and there were several times on a Sunday, 40, 50, 60, even at times over 70 people received the gift of the Holy Ghost in one service. I'm not saying because we were something powerful, but if you just keep fasting and praying and fasting and praying, and you're saying, God, I want to see revival, you will see revival break out like you will not see by just waiting for it to come. All right. Prepare your meals as you exit. Number seven, you can't hurt yourself. I did hurt myself on a couple of different fasts because of the way I ate when I came off the fast. I did not pray for temperance, which is something you should pray for towards the end of a fast, self-control, because what I would think was I've earned this. You don't even want to know what I ate when I broke 40 days, by the way. You'll be like, what in the world? How are you alive? I don't know. The stomach of a goat. But, like, it was just like, how in the world? But what we do is we, re- we want to reward our flesh for what we just suffered through. The problem is sometimes when you reward your flesh, you resurrect your flesh with the reward. I want to say this before I go to the next thing, and that is the greatest enemy to your breakthrough to your fasting is comfort. The good, good is the enemy of great. The, the past successes, the revival you've already seen, the prayers that have already been answered, the, the dimension that you're at where you're comfortable is the greatest obstacle you need to conquer. If you think you've seen everything God can do, you're comfortable. If you think that nothing's gonna change, you're comfortable. If you think you've arrived, you're comfortable. And comfort is the killer of the next dimension. You've got to kill that thing that says, I'm good where I am. No, we're not. We're not good where we are. Someone asked us, how come your church is growing so quickly in one year? And I said, we have a desperation factor. We don't have a building. And when you don't have a building, you can't get comfortable. But a lot of churches get to 200, 300 people. I said this for 20 years evangelizing, and they get comfortable because they have a beautiful building. They've got a perfect little place, and they just, it's just us four, no more. And God's going to send the rain someday, and they live their entire lives praying and prophesying God send the rain instead of saying, let's go make the rain happen. Let's fast and pray till something breaks. And then if you do that, it opens up. I have been to churches as an evangelist that were fasting and praying before we got there, and the results at those churches were far greater than the churches that were waiting on revival. In CLC in Stockton, California, in five weeks, they had prayed and fasted weeks after weeks after weeks, and in five weeks, we watched God fill 402 people with the Holy Ghost. Over 200 were baptized. Witches got the Holy Ghost. Atheists got the Holy Ghost. Satanists got the Holy Ghost. Muslims got the Holy Ghost. Hindus got the Holy Ghost. If you want a revival that breaks and shakes everything, you got to fast and pray into existence and believe we're not comfortable where we are. We want more. I believe I'm in an atmosphere that's hungry for more. I'm starting to feel hunger. I'm starting to feel some hunger in that pew. I want more than where I've seen God do and what I've seen him do. I'm hurrying through this here. All right. I'm condensing all this into one night. I'm not a long-winded preacher normally, so I'm trying to go as fast as I can. There's so much here. When Jesus said, when you fast and you want men to see, he said, those type of people have their reward. He mentions the, re- the word reward two times in our text. A reward from man and a reward from God. These two words, reward, are two totally different words in the Greek. The, the reward you get as a hypocrite, when you're trying to impress everybody, that word reward is misthos. It's the wages or dues paid for your hours of labor, like a paycheck that helps you in the moment. It's not that you won't get a reward. You will get a reward. It's just going to be very, very temporary in what it does for you. It's going to be something very, very small, insignificant. It's going to help you through the trial that you're in. Maybe that's all you want, but if there's another reward available, you should think about going for this one. It's God's reward. Apodidomai. This is what this word is in Greek. To deliver. To give away for one's own profit what is one's own. In other words, to release something for something better. Mm. To pay off what is due. To, to bring things that were promised under oath to you. 
to render into one's account, to give back, to restore. These are things God does when you're fasting to him. So you either can go try to impress people with your fast and get a temporary touch that helps you in the moment but doesn't fix it in August or September, or you can get a hold of God and all the things that you've lost, he starts sending back to you. The people that, life of the Holy Ghost, there are prodigals that left this church the last 10 years that are going to start coming back in 2024 because a spirit of fasting is coming upon this people, and they were here and they wept, and they prayed, and they walked out. But they're coming back this year because God said, I will restore them to you. You may think that's general, but it's going to be somebody's baby in this room right now that they're waiting on God to bring back. They've been praying. They've been shataya. They've been asking. They've been crying, but they're about to fast for it. And when they fast for it, it's over. It's over. All right, let me give you five. Last, this is the last five rewards for fasting from God. Number one, the reward of direction. Ezra chapter eight. Ezra chapter eight, and we're going to read verse 21 through 23, and then verse 31. Ezra chapter eight, verse 21. through 23. They're at a river. They need direction. What do we do? Ezra 28, 21, I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us, for our little ones, and for all our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy because we had spoken to the king saying the hand of our God is upon all of them for good that seek him. We told the king we don't need your help because God's with us. He's going to take care of us. His power and his wrath is against all of them that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this. In other words, we were tempted to get people involved, to get people to answer our prayer. Because that's what we do. When, when God doesn't do it the way we want him to and when we want him to, we hook God up with our miracle by getting people involved, like Abraham did with Hagar. We find someone to be the source because the source is not doing what we want him to do. And so Ezra said, I was too ashamed to get other people involved because I had bragged about my God and how he would do it for us. And in verse 31, it said, then we departed from the river of Hava, the 12th day of the first month, to go into Jerusalem, ready? And the hand of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and of such as lay in wait by the way. He said there were traps we didn't even know about, but because we fasted, God protected us and got us out of that. The reward of direction comes by fasting. Number two, Esther chapter four, verse 16, it is the reward of protection. Esther chapter four, sorry, verse 16, not chapter two. Esther four, verse 16, when they're about to die and they're being threatened, you know this verse. The Bible says, Esther said, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. Neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my men Maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, and which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. I'm going to die fasting. She said, I'll either die from the fast or I'm going to die in the presence of the king. But I don't care if he, if he rejects it. I'll know I went out fasting and believing for a miracle, not feasting and waiting and complaining. I'm going to do all I can do. It's almost like we're so frail. We're so small. But if you will do everything you can do to get the king's attention, the king can rule in such a way and give you such a level of favor that you could never receive on your own. 
So you bring your loaves and fishes and you do everything you can because he can bring protection. And of course, you know the rest of the story. The, the evil people's motives were uncovered and Esther was saved and her family and all the people were saved because of her fasting. Brings protection. Number three, the reward of provision. When Jesus fasted 40 days, the first miracle he performed was a miracle of provision when he turned water into wine and he didn't even say one thing about it. He didn't say water become wine. He just said fill the pots with water and he thought it. And when he thought about the water becoming wine, the water became wine. And if he ever thinks about you, Anything can change in your life. He said, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. In the Hebrew, expected end is the end that you hope for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And so when you are fasting and you are believing God, you get an outcome that you've been desiring. Put it up against anybody's doubt and criticisms because I know what I'm talking about because it's happened too many times. Number four, the reward of salvation. Who needs salvation to hit your family? Acts chapter 10, verse 32 through 34. Acts chapter 10, verse 32 through 34. I'm hurrying and we'll get through this, but I'll release an impartation in this room and several people are about to go on fast. It's quiet, but it's true. Acts chapter 10, 30 through 32 instead of 32 through 34. Chapter 10, verse 30. Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting. Until this hour, the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. Behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. Thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa. Call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Skip down to verse 44 through 48. After this fast is complete, Peter shows up. Peter starts talking to them. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. Many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How they know, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Cornelius' whole household, all of his family, his servants, everybody that lived there was saved, filled washed in the blood of Jesus because some guy fasted the answer into the house. If you want your family saved, start fasting for them to be saved. Don't just pray for them to be saved. Y'all good? All right. This is it, then we're done. So you've got the reward of direction, the reward of protection, the reward of provision, the reward of salvation. Number five, the reward of demonstration. This for sure will happen. (laughs) Demonstration, the power of God, comes after fasting like nothing else. The best example I have for you is Elijah, who, you look at his life pre-fast and post-fast, it's amazing to me. Before he fasted 40 days, he was, first of all, he was pretty bad. He's the first person to ever raise someone from the dead in the Bible. No one ever been raised from the dead except Elijah shows up and raises the kid from the dead. He's the one that stopped the rain. He said, I'm going to pray, and God's going to stop the rain. And God stopped the rain. He's the one that went to the widow woman and said, if you will just give me that cake, there will be meal, meal in your barrel every day until the rain comes. And, and the prophecy came to pass. A pretty powerful dude. And then he went to Mount Carmel, uh, Pastor Jones, and he, he said, the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And so Elijah prays a 63-word prayer. And in the middle of that prayer, lightning or fire, falls from heaven and consumes the sacrifice and the water and this dude is not to be messed with I mean he's most people would be pretty content to be right there pretty powerful you raise the dead you pray down the fire you you got miracle working prophetic anointing in you only problem is there's this girl named Jezebel I don't see very many ladies and husbands naming their daughter Jezebel there's nothing in a name how come there's no boys named Judas in here Ahab, 
Jezebel was not impressed with the pre-fast Elijah. And she said, I don't care all this stuff. Tomorrow you're dead. And Elijah believed her. He ran in fear, and he gets out in the middle of the wilderness under a juniper tree, which is a half-dead tree, and says, Lord, let me die. Now, I can prove to you he did not want to die. Because if you want to die, why are you trying to get shade? Like, if you're done, just be done. Face plant in the sand, bro. See ya. Bye. He's under the tree saying, oh, let me die. You don't want to die. You want to recover. But you're so weary that you're saying things like, I can't take it one more day. I can't go on much longer. If I don't get a word this week, I'm not going back. God, no, if you really love me, why don't you do something? You, you're saying things like you want to quit, but you keep coming on a Monday night because even though your flesh wants to quit, something in your spirit says, I want to revive. I want to live. I want to make it. I want to go farther. I want to beat. I want to beat this. That's why you come on Sunday morning and you stagger in. But before church is over, hands are raised, tears are rolling, and you feel God. Why? Because even though my flesh is weary, something draws me back to restoration and recovery when I'm in his presence. And so the angel said, you know, you know the story. He's laying there, an angel wakes up, wakes him up, and an angel's got food, and he's got cake and water, but that's not coincidence, by the way. He gives him the exact meal that the widow woman gave him. He's trying to remind him, dude, remember last time? And if I came through before, I'm going to come through again. Some of you need to remember that. If he came through before, I know it's simple, but you need to tell yourself, he came through before, He'll come through again. He came through before. He'll come through again. And, and so Elijah said, uh, and the angel said, arise and eat. And so here's Elijah eating angel food cake. This is where it was invented. I have biblical proof. It's a cake. An angel made it. I didn't even know there was angels that were chefs. Elijah eats it. This dude is arrogance on another level and goes back to sleep. While the angel is there, if I wake up tonight and I stagger the kitchen for some chocolate and there's a seven-foot angel in there baking a cake, I'm not going back to sleep for weeks. I'm going to live in the kitchen. He's coming back. <laughs> Elijah goes back to sleep. Man, if I'm the angel, I'm like, dude, I gave you the cake, but you're getting the skillet now. Pow. In fact, it said that the Lord sent the angel a second time, which means that angel flew from heaven to earth, cooked, did not get, and there's nothing more rude than when you've cooked something for everybody, and then they came and say, thank you. And you're like, did you like it? And they're like, yeah. And you're like, hmm. Apparently you didn't. If you're a new husband, always like it. She went to die. And so the angel came back, which means he flew back. That's a long flight. I mean, he's, he's got some jet lag. And so he says, hey, arise and eat, dude. The journey, this time he says this, the journey is too great for you. So Elijah's like, ooh, what does that mean? And Elijah eats this food and goes 40 days, Pastor Jones. 40 days. Ready? Here's, here's some stuff for you. Here you go. 40 days to Mount Horeb. This is the same place that Moses fasted. Hear you? Elijah is climbing the same mountain that Moses climbed. Elijah stops halfway up and gets into a cave. God comes down and says, what are you doing here? The last guy went all the way to the top. 
you're quitting because you're still believing the enemy's words even though you're fasting. You cannot get over what the devil told you. And so you're sitting there in depression while you're waiting on a miracle. Get out of the cave. When you come off this fast, don't be depressed. Don't hang your head. Stop saying my anxiety. Stop claiming ownership of a demon. Am I okay? I'm gonna... Anxiety means fear in Greek, and fear is a spirit. And every time you take ownership of anxiety, you are pet feeding a demon, saying it's, it's just mine, it's who I am. It's not who you are. You are a child of God. It's a spirit trying to hold you. It's not my depression, it's not my anger, it's, it's depression that I'm getting away from. It's a spirit that's not going to control me. Here it is, let's all stand. Elijah comes out, gets the anointing, gets power. What's the difference in the pre-fast Elijah and the post-fast Elijah? One story shows it all. He's up on a mountain. King hears about it sends 50 soldiers and one captain. And the captain says, hey, man of God, the king said, come down. And Elijah said, if I'm a man of God, let fire fall and consume you, and you're 50, dead. The second captain with 50 comes up. I'm not sure if you should use the word stupid in the pulpit, but if there was someone that was ever stupid, he, it's, he's more bold. He said, hey, man of God, the king said, come down quickly. And Elijah said, if I'm a man of God, let fire fall and consume you and you're 50. You got 102 dead dudes right there. Third guy shows up, and he has some brain cells. He's like, okay, everybody's dead around me. Uh, please don't kill me. Wisdom. Promote this guy. Wisdom. He said, please. And God said, go with him. And it hit me. Before the fast, he had to pray for fire to fall. Post-fast, he calls it down. It's called dominion. Before, he's praying, God, do it. Oh, God, hear me. Oh, God, make a way. And God said, I got you. I'll do it. But after he's fasted so many days, he said, it's going to happen now. And it happens. There is a dimension called dominion that this church is going to step into with corporate fasting this year. I don't know how many hundreds of days will be fasted in 2024 by this church. But when the fasting season is over at the end of this year, there will be dominion in some of your lives that you've never dreamed of. You will speak and God will move. You will declare it. People that you would normally say, I'm going to pray for you. You're going to say, God's going to do it. God's going to take care of it. It's already done. And you're going to go, that's not even me. Oh, you're right. It's not you. It's the dominion from fasting and praying that comes to you. Who wants it? Who wants God to do something? Who's more desperate for a miracle than you are a pizza? Who's more desperate for a touch from God in your situation than you are feeling full at night? There's something that only happens when you make up your mind to go get it. I'm going to pray for you, but I want you to come up to the altar right now. I'm going to release a prayer upon you, and I'm asking you to receive it. And as several of you are going to receive it, there's going to be dates that come to mind, dates on the calendar of when you're going to start, and you're going to tell your pastor, and he's going to pray for you and he's going to cover you and blessings upon blessings are going to come and the enemies that have hovered over you are going to lose their grip upon you and their power upon you. Would you raise your hands right now and by the authority of the word of God and by the power of the name of Jesus and by the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon us, I release a spirit of fasting in this room upon every man, every woman, every boy, 
in every curl and I release hunger for the deeper things of God. Let there be dreams and visions. Let there be miracle signs and wonders. I pray for the cripple to walk at this church. I pray for the blind to see. I pray for the deaf to hear. I pray for job openings. I pray for job opportunities. I pray for favor that people are not qualified to receive. I pray for restoration in marriages. I pray for miracles in children. I pray for healings in houses. I pray for the prodigals to come home. I speak dimensions of favor that you've never stepped into that are waiting on you to get uncomfortable and to get hungry. I release an uncomfortable hunger upon you that keeps you awake at night and says you must go to the mountain. You must climb. You must pray. You must fast. You must seek the Lord. Would you lift up your hands, lift up your voice, and let it rain on you right now? Would you let the Holy Ghost fall upon you? When's the last time you prayed until tears rolled and you didn't care who was watching and you didn't care what you had to do? I need an answer. I need a miracle from God. I need a touch from God. Come on. Don't wait on anybody else. It's all upon you. Just reach out and receive it. Reach out and grab it. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go, Pastor. I'm gonna go. Pastor, I gotta go for it. Pastor, I gotta get an answer. Pastor, my family needs a miracle. Pastor, my family needs a breakthrough. I know what to do. Put the key in the lock. Push the plate away. Put the key in the lock. Push the plate away. Push the plate away. And you'll see the things. something to you right now I was just on a fast and my one of my elders called me and he didn't know I was fasting and he told me to stop he said Josh you have fasted so many days hundreds of days the last several years and he said you cannot kill your flesh dead enough for your church to have revival he said the only way your church has that breakthrough revival is if fasting gets loose in the whole church not just the pastor doing it. He said, if it ever gets loose in the whole church, and 17 of the last 18 weeks, God has filled somebody with the Holy Ghost on Sunday morning. Let me tell you something. It can break loose. I feel it. It's not the will of God for Moses to go die on the mountain every time the church needs a miracle. It's the will of God for the church to rise up and say, we want it. We want it in this building. We want it in our neighborhood, at our school, in our family, at our job, with our car, in our family. Would you get a little bit of a war cry anointing on you right now? Would someone get a little bit of a soldier spirit? And I'm going to get an answer. I'm going to get an answer for my kids. I'm going to get an answer for my babies. I'm going to get a breakthrough in this. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. I feel a spirit of fasting. I feel miracles coming to this church. There will be a bigger building one day also. There will be a bigger building one day also. And you will look back at the fasting and you will say, fasting forced us to go beyond where we were. We had to do it. Something broke. I'm telling you, you may not even say, I don't care what you see or feel. I'm telling you what I see in the spirit. There is something that breaks open. Fasting hits the people. We're just a church plant, but we've had over 300 guests the last three months. 19 first-time guests with their Sunday morning. But our people are doing one thing, praying and fasting, praying and fasting. We believe it. We believe it. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. They're talking to their neighbors. We're meeting in their houses. Let's connect to something. It's going to happen. This church is way too powerful. 
Way too many years of experience. Way too many testimonies to wait any longer. It is time to rise and take the territory like never before. It is time to take dominion. I bind the prince of this city in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I loose this pastor. Everything he wants to do, let it happen. Every dream he has, let it happen. Everything he sees, let him have it, God. Open the doors of favor upon him as he steps out of the boat and walks on the water. Let him have the things he's asking for. The old prophecies are going to manifest. The old dreams will come true. He's fighting for a breakthrough. Let the warriors get behind him and say we're with you we're going we're going let's do this Get with your pastor. Get behind your pastor. Would you stretch your hands toward him? Don't drain him. Just stretch your hands toward him. And God's going to give him the things he's asking for. He has wept for this. He has been up late hours. He has wondered and questioned and prayed and wept for your family. It's time for you to push a plate away and say, for my pastor, let it be done. For my pastor, let it be done. Let it be done. Let it be done. Let his dreams come true. Let his prayers be answered. Give him the desires of his heart. The greatest dreams. The things he sees happening. Let them happen. The things he feels in the spirit. And ladies, Get behind your pastor's wife with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. I don't know where she's at, but I want to pray for her tonight also. Would you pray and pray God to bless her and strengthen her and protect her and keep her and guard her because the Lord cannot do it with just one. It must be both. Give them renewed energy and renewed strength in the Holy Ghost. You see the tears that no one has seen. You've heard the great cries in the night. Sister Jones has prayed for so many of these ladies hoping for the best, hoping they become what the Lord has told her they would. God, let them get behind her. Let them fast for her. Let them fast for her babies. Let them fast for this family. Let them fast for this church. I want everybody on your list to put your pastor and his family on your list. I don't know what their prayers are. I don't know what their needs are. But I'm asking you, when you go on your fast, I want the first thing to be for my pastor, his dreams, his family. I want that to be the cry, the cry of your heart, the cry of your spirit. Because it'll flow down to you. It'll flow down to you. Blessings upon blessings. I bless you in Jesus' name. I bless you with peace and strength and favor and hope and joy and laughter. You got the Holy Ghost. Would you pray till you're praying in the Holy Ghost right now? Would you lift up your voice and pray in the Spirit? Would you pray in the Holy Ghost? Could you pray until you're praying God prayers?
but between you and God. The man of God said that dates would come to your mind, times and seasons, that you should consecrate yourself before the Lord. I want you to just make a vow before God right now and say, Lord, as you placed it on my heart, as you put that date in my mind in that season, I'm going to dedicate myself to fasting and prayer and intercession and the Word of God. And I will see the revival that I have prayed for and waited for. I will see my family return to God. I will see the miracles and the signs and the wonders. Come on, proclaim it. You proclaim it. You say it. I will see what you have promised I will hold in my hand the child that the doctor said was impossible you say it I will be free I will walk in the liberty the power of the holiness of God Yela mahati oloko riyama no loko yela maha. Hallelujah.
shall come to pass. You are going to break out of your financial struggles at the end of this fast. You're going to break out of your financial struggles. There's going to be surplus. There's going to be savings. I speak it in the name of Jesus. This is a season you're coming out of. The blessing and the favor of God are going to find you, follow you. Hallelujah. No more vacillating between two opinions. No more wondering what the will of God is. God is going to speak to you directly, clearly. And you will know the will of God. And you will walk in the will of God. Hallelujah. Follow the Spirit. I understand if you have children and they have school and you need to leave. We understand. But if the Lord is dealing with you and speaking to you and leading you, just wait on Him for a few moments. Let Him determine when He's finished speaking. Let Him determine when you're full and overflowing with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Jesus, mighty name.